I'm very pleased um, to introduce Katrin, um, who's going to kick off our um, event. Um, she's a professor for participatory culture at the Baltic Film, Media, Arts and Communication Institute of Tallinn University in Estonia. Um, and she's published research on people's practices um, and meaning making on social media. Um, one of her books which I really enjoyed reading is this one. Um, it's called um, Selfies, Why We Love and Hate Them. Um, and it really has changed my perception on why people take selfies um, and, and what they are doing with it. So I must admit, I've been a pessimist about selfies because I'm looking at it from a tourism lens. Um, and yeah, so I have a more critical approach to taking selfies um, in the tourism context, but this really helped me to understand a different perspective on taking selfies. Um, her most recent book um, is a co-edited or a, a co-authored book on uh, sex and social media and she's also the co-editor of um, a collection of metaphors of the internet. And today she will talk to us about um, abduction, imitation, other ways of making sense of um, visual social media. Um, so here's over to you, Katrin. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, and I'm happy that, yeah, we can do this uh, while it was planned um, to happen a year ago. Um, so, you know, perseverance. Um, so uh, I had uh, a slide here uh, on um, to introduce myself. Uh, but um, you did already did that, so I'm going to skip over most of that. Um, uh, I usually kind of self-identify as a social media researcher, but my background is in uh, sociology. Um, so I usually look at uh, what people are doing on the internet, um, why it's meaningful for them. Um, oftentimes, I take a practice approach or a practice theory approach. Um, and oftentimes I've looked at, um, in particular, visual practices, uh, but my focus uh, usually lies um, at least in part uh, with norms um, and how people make uh, kind of newer localized norms or how what they do online uh, pushes back at kind of broader social imaginaries or uh, broader um, social norms. So here's a, a collection of uh, books that I've written and edited. Um, I'm Estonian, so some of them are in Estonian um, and others are in English. There's way too many. I don't know. It's a it's a disease. <laughs> uh, but onwards uh, to what we actually are going to be talking about today. So the premise of the talk is that uh, we are all in, in interested in what people are doing on social media and why they're doing it and how they're making uh, meaning with it. So how are they attributing meaning to their own practices? And another premise is that we acknowledge that a lot of what people are doing on social media is not just textual, uh, but it is also uh, increasingly visual, or it's actually more accurate to say that it is multimodal, to which I will return. Um, about half of the world's population uses social media. Uh, there are many different platforms and apps. Um, and although we are uh, seeing a concentration of users onto a few giant uh, platforms uh, and into the hands of even fewer companies who own those giant platforms. But altogether, uh, we can say that social media is a kind of hugely important um, interactional situation, a dominant cultural um, and communicative infrastructure. Uh, so if we believe that uh, culture is basically a set of meaning making practices, um, then we need to study what is happening on and with social media uh, in order to understand culture, communication and meaning. However, uh, studying what is happening on and with social media is um, easier said than done because a lot goes on on social media. It is a fast moving kind of intertextual flow of stuff. So do we study people's accounts? Uh, do we study aggregated feeds of content? Do we study specific posts? Do we study communities? Meaning is made at each of these levels. 
So I wanted to share with you um, some ideas and some tactics that I have been uh, working with uh, and on over the past 10 years or so um, uh, in order to answer a variety of research questions. And broadly, they gather around uh, these three mindsets, which are abduction, imitation, and sense, and sense making. So um, how do we break down this huge task that is studying meaning making uh, so that uh, research questions and research methods can reveal themselves? One approach is to say that if we're interested in meaning making, then meaning making is always contextual and to focus on the kind of relevant contexts in the um, socially mediated situations. So what kinds of contexts uh, are we dealing with? And today I thought that we would think of context in three categories. So social media meaning making as happening multimodally in uh, social media posts, social media meaning making as happening in an aggregated manner in streams and flows of content and interaction, um, uh, these both can be seen as stemming from the technological context or the affordances uh, of social media as a context. And then the third is social media meaning making as shaped by broader social imaginaries, cultural norms and values, and as creating more specific local norms um, and repertoires. So that one uh, can be considered an aspect of the broader kind of sociocultural context. Uh, let's start with multimodality uh, of meaning making as we see it emerging in posts. So uh, Kristen Arola wrote in 2010 uh, that when blogging sites um, and early social networking sites were created in the early 2000s, they created templates for people to express themselves. So this made it much easier for more people to speak because uh, everybody didn't have to build their own homepage. They didn't have to build their own platform, but it also kind of flattened how people could express themselves. So people now could sign up and use a template and this template had things like profi profiles and posts. So we learned to make meaning by creating and interpreting uh, profiles um, and posts. So typically today, a post uh, would combine a visual of some sort, it can be an image, it can be a GIF, it can be a video, uh, some text uh, in a caption or in a status update, and some hypertext like hashtags or when people are tagged into the post. So I consider these uh, separate modes of communication, and they can also hold further kind of semiotic modes of communication. So social semioticians um, have been arguing for a while that every medium deploys one or more semiotic resources or what they call modes that are both abstract and rule governed. So the visual in the post is a mode, but and it has a certain grammar and we can talk about the grammar of uh, GIFs versus the grammar of emoji but it can also be broken down into multiple kind of uh, further modes, including things like size, shape, color, perspective, composition, so forth. So modes operate um, according to uh, communicative and cultural conventions. So a mode can be thought of as a resource for meaning in the sense that it uh, sets off particular cultural associations in our heads. Uh, so posts are a dominant way of communicating in social media. Posts combine a variety of modes, thus posts are multimodal, thus meaning making on social media is multimodal. It means that different modes interact with each other to produce this universe of meanings that is more than the sum of its parts, right? That's the bit that I want you to kind of take forward as we move on. Um, if we think of uh, a post and imagine a very typical post, let's say on Instagram, um, it has an image, uh, it has a caption that has some text in it, but it also uh, at tags some people and it uses some hashtags. And then it has some comments, some of the comments use text, other comments use emoji and uh, other comments uh, also um, uh, have hashtags uh, or at tag users. 
So what are the methodological implications of all of these modes of communication that merge into a post? And what do we already know about people's meaning makings with these modes from existing research? Uh, to kind of jam pack a huge amount of work into one slide, we know that uh, visual is a socially richer mode than text. So visuals are polysemious, uh, are carry multiple meanings. Um, they have been uh, researched to be better for expressions um, of emotion um, and uh, kind of iconic uh, representations, uh, like a wave breaking um, in order to show overwhelming emotion. Moreover, images are more efficient at depicting humorous situations, like sliding on a banana peel or uh, boxes falling on top of a person. Um, text, in contrast, is used more to describe personal situations um, and express sarcasm. Um, and it conveys uh, more negative emotion compared to images based on what we know how people use these modalities on the internet, right? Uh, but of course, it also, all of these things depend on the text and depend on the image or the visual. So, you know, is the visual a video? Is it a GIF? Is it an image? Is it an emoji? Is it a selfie? Is it a string of emojis? Is it a well-known meme? Is it a selfie? Those all carry kind of their own universes of meaning into the moment of meaning making. So we know that these different visuals have a variety of functions from memory making um, to identity construction, which has kind of always been the function of, of photography, uh, but then uh, socially mediated and networked and shared visuals uh, tend to kind of have these additional functions um, of uh, emphasizing the accompanying text, uh, of expressing emotion, uh, or saying something about yourself in face-saving ways, um, as we can do when somebody says something stupid or insulting, and instead of responding that this was stupid and insulting, we just post a reaction GIF of Jessica Jones or Iron Man rolling their eyes, right? So we kind of express ourselves and reactions by proxy. Um, Similarly, hashtags have been researched to have a, a variety of social functions. So hashtagging uh, on a kind of utilitarian level makes social media content searchable, right? So it creates kind of machine readable categories, but um, it is also used uh, for um, a kind of distinctly rhetorical practice uh, of meta communication. So hashtags uh, can emphasize or iterate or critique or, um, rally um, around a particular part of the message in the post. Hashtags can take evaluative stances about a topic or what is said um, in the text or communicated in the visual. So a post holds a very rich uh, kind of uh, amount of different kinds of uh, stuff um, that we can make meaning with. And now we get to the first of the three tactics that I wanted to talk today. Uh, talk about today, which is imitation. So you've probably all heard the kind of vernacular saying that imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Um, and whoever has a background in education is probably uh, well versed in uh, the work out there that uh, looks at learning through imitation. Um, there is less work on imitation as a method uh, for studying meaning making, but there is some. For example, John Fenn um, has written in 2014 about mimetic inquiry in ethnography. So what he means by that is that when interpreting cultural production, and he was studying digital artists and digital art, uh, we could experiment with uh, the forms and techniques that the artists themselves used to produce that art. So basically an ethnographic interpretation um, that echoes the artistic practice. Uh, Johannes Sjöberg has written about ethnographic fieldwork as mimicry in the uh, Kailua sense of play, including role play um, uh, being a form of mimicry. So the base assumption is that in ethnographic fieldwork, participants and ethnographers mimic reality through co-created role play and through that reveal kind of implicit information. 
So there are multiple ways to extend this idea of imitation into ethnographic work and into work with social media. An obvious uh, kind of approach is to experiment with whatever you are studying yourself. So to take an auto ethnographic uh, approach. So you kind of imitate what uh, the people you're interested in are doing in order to know what it feels like, right? What does it feel like to create a meme? What does it feel like to post a selfie and have people comment on it? Another option, and I've written um, about this a bit in an ethics uh, chapter in the handbook of internet research, uh, is to imitate the local norms of communication when you are defining the boundaries of your field site for approaching participants. But today I wanted to rather think of imitating forms of meaning making when uh, making meaning for research. So if social media affords multimodal meaning making, then how do we imitate multimodality as an analytical frame? Um, what I have done the most of is to uh, mimic multimodality in how I articulate research questions and what my units of analysis are. So if social media uh, affords multimodality, then it makes sense to analyze it multimodally and intertextually, right? It sounds pretty obvious, uh, but you would be surprised how little people uh, researching social media or relying on social media data seem to actually think about it, um, at least uh, in as far as I see when I'm reviewing. Uh, so the premise is simple. Uh, if the meaning lies in a post, then a post should be analyzed. And the fact that your automated tools for scraping social media content are only capable of giving you captions and hashtags and not images is not a good enough reason to yank an organic part of what was built as a post and what is consumed as a post out of its context and to claim that you can still make good enough meaning based on that. Uh, further, the meaning in the different modes incorporated into the post um, has to be made in context of other modes, right? So the visual needs to be understood in the context of the caption and the hashtag and vice versa. Posts, in turn, need to be analyzed in their broader context, and we need to think about and make choices about what the suitable broader context for the post is. Is it all other posts that have been created by the account holder? Is it all posts under the same hashtag? Is it all posts that somebody sees uh, in their kind of feed or wall experience? These three are very different perspectives. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm saying that we need to be mindful of this and make a choice of what our unit of analysis is and what we are then arguing uh, based on it. So it's very kind of common to also muddy these things up where you are actually researching one context but making claims about a different one. So I usually call this approach uh, contextual social media analysis. Uh, but another tactic um, of imitation, and perhaps a more creative one to go with the conference theme, could be mood boarding as method or mood boards as an analytical metaphor. So this is something that I've thought about a bit, uh, and my friend and mentor Annette Markham is uh, adamant that I have to write a methods book about it, but as of yet it uh, exists only in my head mostly in my head. Um, so mood boards are a physical uh, or digital uh, collages uh, of or collections of uh, usually visual material uh, that evokes a certain uh, style or a certain concept or a certain emotion. So usually uh, designers use mood boards, illustrators, photographers, filmmakers, all types of creative professionals create mood boards to communicate the feel of an idea to the team or before they start work or, or as part of a kind of design assignment. So I will start by showing you some examples of what can be called naturally occurring mood boards on social media. And I will then make some kind of propositions about mood boarding as a method for understanding social media meaning making. Um, so first, of course, there is Pinterest. 
uh, where everything is a mood board in a sense, or at least can be seen as such. Uh, but then of course, people also have uh, Pinterest boards for mood boards. So they collect other people's or their own uh, mood boards. Um, this one is from Instagram. Uh, it, all, it calls itself a mood board and it calls itself a niche meme. Uh, so niche memes are a genre of highly stylized memes um, that are really specific to the creator's own life experiences, often related to mental health. But overall, um, they tackle relatable taboos that people don't like to talk about in real life. So this one is a mood board somebody made uh, for their depression, if their depression was a person. Um, the, uh, this one is a character mood board. These are very common, in particular in fandom cultures. So this is a mood board, again, posted on Instagram, and it is for Katie Pidgeholt from an animated series called Voltron. Uh, so this is someone's loving interpretation or a fanish interpretation of a character, a fictional character. Uh, so it can be uh, seen as a mood board, but in addition to that, as a kind of fan creation or an expression of fandom. Um, this one um, is from Tumblr, uh, but it's not for a character, it's for two characters, or more correctly, for their imagined relationship, or what fan fiction uh, communities call a ship. So this ship is for Hermione and Draco from Harry Potter. So uh, presuming you've read uh, the books or seen the movies, they weren't actually friends or a couple in the kind of canonical text, but in fandom imaginaries, some people kind of wanted them to be. Um, so uh, this is a, a mood board for what's called a Dramione, so Draco and Hermione put together as a kind of romantic coupling. Um, uh, they don't call it a mood board, they call it a character board, but the point remains, some images are from the movies, others are not, um, and uh, sometimes these are created to go with a particular piece of fan fiction, and sometimes somebody creates a board and a fan fiction writer will then be inspired by it and write a story. Um, this one is also for a ship, uh, for two characters from a TV show called Teen Wolf, um, who are also not together in the series. Here we see some pictures of the actors uh, who played the characters, uh, but some are pictures of models who just look like them from a certain angle. Um, and uh, I presume that these images were chosen to highlight uh, a particular uh, feature of the character's physique or to maybe showcase uh, what the two characters like about each other in the author's fantasy uh, where they are madly in love. Um, there's a quote in the middle, uh, which is attributed to Ruben Holmes. I don't know if it is really uh, his. And uh, this was not in the TV show. So, so it brings in an additional source. Um, and the board even comes with a playlist. So this is a multimodal, multi-sensory board. Finally, uh, this uh, is a, another genre or a subgenre. Uh, it's very popular on Tumblr, but you can also see it uh, on Instagram. This is called a stim board uh, from the word stimulation. Uh, so instead of static images, you have videos or GIFs in every frame. So everything is jiggling and wobbling um, uh, at, in order to create a particular kind of aesthetic and effective um, effect. So stimming uh, is something that is done by people on the spectrum. So uh, who have found that if they fidget or they do something um, uh, uh, like that, it, uh, it kind of makes them feel safe and it is uh, comforting. Uh, so uh, it calms them down and reduces anxiety. So people create stim boards for themselves and for others, but then other people um, just like them or, or kind of learn the practice. So it became more popular. Um, so stim boards replicate this uh, kind of purposeful stimming um, to give people who find those images relaxing something to stimulate them in a safe and contained way. And fans, again, come up with fandom specific stim boards, which use the color palette of their favorite characters or use objects uh, tangentially related to um, that character. So these are kind of reimaginings. So what are we going to do with this? 
you know, it's a, a, a collection of stuff. Um, looking across these examples, we could argue that we have these very carefully curated uh, combinations of various visuals that utilize color, texture, fonts, and patterning in very purposeful ways. They're intended to communicate emotions, attitudes, assessments, but also sensory impulses and physical embodied responses like fear or pain or sexual arousal. So if we think of what uh, the social media mood boards afford, then it seems that they uh, evoke uh, feelings and ideas. Uh, they creatively express, uh, they interpret something, uh, they enhance experience and they uh, often kind of help articulate the inarticulable. And as far as meaning making goes, this is pretty nuanced. Um, so what can we learn from this? If in, in the kind of um, light of uh, imitation, what does it uh, mean when we think of mood board as method? Uh, it means that we can think of social media accounts as people's mood boards, right? Uh, it means that we can think of social media trends um, as cultural or collective mood boards and analyze them as such. But uh, even if we are not interested in social media, what we can do is that we can mood board our field site. We can mood board our research participants. We as ethnographers can mood board ourselves as ethnographers, we can mood board any kind of ethnographic rich points. Um, and if we do, then the next exercise that's useful is to make your mood boards and then interrogate uh, what your categories of inclusion and exclusion were and what does that tell you? So it becomes a kind of um, exercise of self-reflection. Okay. Second one of the three uh, tactics um, and contexts that we're talking about today. Uh, social media meaning making as happening in a stream, uh, in streams and flows of content and interaction. So we know that social media platforms foster transience rather than permanence. This doesn't mean that self presentation on social media has no coherence or autobiographical narrative, but rather that such narratives uh, embrace the speed and the immediacy of social media and need to be again understood in that light. Uh, so on most kind of popular well-known social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, uh, people's posts flow in remix streams. So my stuff remixes with your stuff, different modes or modalities of communication mix, multiple posts make a feed or a dashboard or a wall experience. So this is an important contextual characteristics. Uh, while it's kind of common uh, for um, uh, satirists or caricaturists to poke fun at people who post on social media by equating this with the act of yelling, I had pasta for lunch out of the window, um, the, an the analogy is really not that apt if you take into consideration, consideration this contextual characteristic. Uh, a restaurant check-in or a post that's, you know, off your lunch uh, on a Facebook uh, feed or an Instagram feed joins this endless kind of quickly refreshing throng of other similar content. There's a rhythm to it. Um, and this rhythm and uh, the speed of movement um, influences how we make sense of what it means and uh, how public or private it is and what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Um, so the main issue with uh, flow and streams is that uh, it is impossible uh, to capture it in its entirety uh, in its living form. Uh, but if there is a methodological approach well positioned to deal with this impossibility, it is ethnography. Uh, because instead of obsessing with capturing it all, we can immerse ourselves in the flow, we can get the flow, we can describe it, and then we can focus on moments within it that are um, salient or important. 
So people have been thinking along those lines for some time. Uh, for example, Annette Markham and Simon Lingren wrote in 2014 about flow as a process and about flow oriented work. So they say that when working uh, in a flow oriented manner, we first immerse ourselves in the flow for a longer period of time, and we value this immersion over data collection. So they suggest that the goal is to identify patterns uh, and to explore how these patterns repeat themselves across uh, different uh, fields of interest. Um, a key characteristic for them of flow as a process is that it is analytically selective and not comprehensive. Uh, so the researchers' choices are a natural part of moving through the flow, and instead of pretending that we can see everything, we need to be critically aware and reflexive of the choices uh, we make. And this is how we uh, reach the second tactic that I wanted to talk about today, uh, because I would like to suggest that abduction, abduction is a, a great alternative um, for finding meaning from the flow. Um, if you read a lot of um, texts on ethnographic methods, you have heard about abduction, abductive logic uh, before. Uh, the idea of uh, abductive logic is usually attributed to the logician and semiotician Charles Pierce. Uh, but my favorite ethnographic text about abduction is uh, by Michael um, Agar from 2006. So abduction is uh, kind of really what it um, says on the tin. So when you imagine being abducted by aliens or kidnapped, it refers to letting yourself to be led away. So a popular reference would be to say that you go down the rabbit hole, right? Um, so Agar describes it as finding and experiencing ethnographic rich points or these moments of surprise and taking them seriously as indicators of what you are yet to understand. So moments of surprise and incongru incongruence are our friends and we want to follow them um, and they help us find meaning in the flow. Uh, so I want to share a couple of moments of abduction that I have experienced. Um, I've written a lot on selfies and I was among the first researchers publishing on selfies and because selfies ended up becoming quite a big research area, um, then uh, sometimes people uh, attribute to me this kind of um, a clairvoyance or a stroke of genius in finding this topic, and I cannot claim this at all. Um, all I can claim is that I allowed myself to be abducted, to be led away, to follow people down the rabbit hole. So when I started my PhD in uh, 2011, I started with the knowledge that I am researching identity and specifically how internet shapes our identity. So my idea was to look at blogs and bloggers on Tumblr and see how what they post and how they post and what they read and what kind of information they consume and who they talk to, how that shapes their sense of self. But then in my first round of interviews, everybody was talking about these pictures that people would post uh, and take of themselves. And no one used the word selfie, uh, even though it did exist already, but it wasn't that popular yet. Instead, the jargon was um, at the time quite uh, aggressively self-shooting. So people were talking about self-shooters and, and self-shooting. Um, and uh, so I kind of let myself be led towards finding out what that means and never really turned back. Um, going down that rabbit hole led me uh, uh, to uh, kind of findings that allowed me to make arguments about selfies, uh, write a book about selfies, a lot of um, uh, chapters and articles on selfies, etc. And there's a lot in it, and I'm not going to go into it all, uh, but important for our conversation going forward um, is one aspect of what I found, namely that people's selfie practices were kind of small p political. So even when they were trivial selfies, like sexy selfies or nudes, uh, or uh, seemingly vain kind of celebrations of um, look at my butt, uh, they were often forms of resisting or rejecting hegemonic norms, in particular uh, pertaining to uh, gender roles, sexuality, body size, ability, etc. 
Um, people's selfie practices help them to repair their relationship to their own body. And after that, often to kind of gain a political voice that they used first to stand up for themselves. For example, when they got anonymous internet hate for how their body looked or how they chose to present themselves. Um, and then over time, I noticed that they started using their newfound a genteel voice uh, to also advocate for others. Um, if you're interested in this, I, you know, you can email me. I have lots of publications on it. Okay, but that was abduction on a very large scale, and it doesn't really describe the nuance of what I wanted to describe. So how about another example, an abduction within an abduction, and I hope nobody's going to be offended by the subject matter. Um, so while I was trying to figure out uh, what the meaning of selfies and sexy selfies was on Tumblr, I noticed that a woman that I was following and who was my research participant had a note on her submit mailbox. So that was a Tumblr feature. Uh, they had a submit mailbox where other people could submit stuff. So you could either look at it or you could post it. Uh, there was a, like a one button to post it immediately on your blog. Um, and so her submit mailbox said, do not send me dick pics. Um, and I was surprised on many levels. Uh, this was something, first of all, it was surprising that it was something that apparently happened enough uh, that you needed to put up a sign that you don't want it. Um, but also, uh, I was kind of surprised that they didn't want these types of pics, even though they sometimes posted pictures that had penises on them. So it was clearly not a general aversion um, to the body part. Um, so I went and looked at the submit mailbox pages of other female bloggers that I was following, and I saw that that was quite a trend. Uh, and mind you, this was before uh, dick pics and critiquing dick pics and conversations about image-based sexual abuse were the cultural discourse that they are now. This was even a couple of months before the Anthony Weiner scandal. I don't know if anybody remembers that. It was an American politician who sent, uh, uh, actually he was wearing boxers, uh, but in the boxers was an erection to a, a college girl. And it was one of the first big conversations that became a scandal and started what now is a, a very big conversation about discrimination and um, sexual abuse. So here I was in a situation where in a culture of body positivity, celebrating nudity, celebra celebrating being almost kind of aggressively sex positive, and kind of purposefully pushing back against norms of what kinds of naked self-expression are allowed, these same people were saying that, no, you cannot send me a particular type of nude selfie because a dick pic is um, a nude selfie, especially by the standards of that co community where fragment uh, pictures were very common, right? So a selfie would be a picture of your clavicle or a picture of your back or a picture of your butt. Um, so this led me to interview women. I, I allowed this surprise to lead me away, to abduct me. So I interviewed women about their experiences of getting these images. And a couple of surprises in what they said led me to interviewing men about their experiences with sending these images. And a couple of surprises in what they said sent me back to women. So it was this kind of um, uh, endless kind of uh, funnel. Um, so very briefly again, because this isn't the topic today, but what my abduction got me was a more nuanced story about these types of pictures to which we usually have a knee jerk reaction, right? Um, so basically what I found was that uh, the women who were annoyed or disgusted at random uh, penis pictures submitted to their blog uh, didn't have a broader aversion to the body part or the pictures. Uh, but it was also not just about consent, as it's often framed, right? That the issue is just that you weren't asked if you wanted. Uh, because some of the images that they accepted and enjoyed were also sent to them without uh, the sender first asking, hey, do you want to see uh, my penis? So to simplify, um, acceptable or kind of good uh, dick pics and unacceptable ones were categories that emerged from the intersection of things like what kind of a story 
does the picture tell? Does it tell a misogynist story of demanding attention or does it tell a respectful story of giving attention? Basically, the rule of thumb here was that uh, dick pics are a bad conversation starter, but after a conversation has been created and attention has been paid to what people like, they can be acceptable or even pleasant. So the difference here is between just sending a dick pic or sending a dick pic and demanding that the, the person posts it on their uh, blog versus sending it to someone who you already have a positive pre-existing interaction it, off or sending it as a tribute, right, as an act of fandom, uh, which means that it has to be stylized or humorous. Um, the problem then was that uh, when women got the pics that told this misogynistic and aggressive story, then they responded in kind. They responded with aggression, usually by shaming the images in ways that went against the very explicit norms of body positivity in the community. So there would be public posts or responses that basically communicated that you shouldn't bother sending a picture like that if your penis wasn't very large and and aesthetically pleasing and you weren't an expert photographer, even though it actually had nothing to do with whether the picture was acceptable or not acceptable. And even though if the same picture was posted on the man's blog, then these norms of body positivity and acceptance and tolerance would have applied to it. Um, so uh, basically, the you know, to kind of bring this all back together is that allowing yourself to be led away and allowing yourself to be led away multiple times, you know, even when you are within one rabbit hole and you see another, so you follow it, um, is a way we get at new findings, new interpretations, new knowledge, uh, new explanations and nuance. That was a lot of new, new news. Um, okay, uh, but abduction is not just a tactic for finding a meaning in a flow, it can also be a tactic for predicting or rather speculating where the flow will go. So Erki Patokorpi and Marco Athenainen um, have written about abduction-based design as a method for opening up the design process in a new creative way that enables designing not only from an existing state uh, to a new state, but also via anomalies and by using imaginary explanations um, and new theoretical frameworks from a non-existing state to completely new futures. And I have done something like that, but I've called it speculative fiction methods. Um, critical scholars, design scholars, and futurists have been developing speculative methods for decades. Uh, from this work, we know that speculation creates spaces for discussion and debate about alternative ways of being. Uh, we know that speculation functions as, as critique um, and as future making, and we know that fiction, using any kind of fictional uh, thinking, it can be fictional writing, but why not things like mood boarding, um, it helps suspend disbelief and spur imagination so we can think outside of the box. So what I have uh, used uh, builds on a speculative science fiction uh, method that was developed uh, again by Annette Markham and Ksenia Kalugina for Ksenia's master's thesis. So I took it and kind of um, developed it further. Um, uh, Socio-literary imagination is what it's sometimes called. Um, and uh, how it works is that it usually works with prompts, right? So you develop prompts from existing knowledge or literature or research, and then you use those prompts uh, to uh, kind of think fictionally towards uh, future trajectories. Uh, so when I was writing my selfie book, what I did was that I analyzed uh, selfie critiques in popular discourse, so in memes, in jokes, in art, and then I analyzed kind of selfie hopes in mostly marketing discourse. And I treated these as concentrated versions of social imaginaries about selfies. And then I came up with prompts like a deleted selfie becomes sentient or young women are banned from taking selfies and their phone administers an electric shock every time they try. Or your device guides you through taking selfies and all selfies that don't meet the criteria are automatically deleted. 
I then asked colleagues and students and friends to write short stories on these prompts. And afterwards, I analyzed those short stories in the context of what futurists, tech journalists, and social media marketing professionals predicted um, to, about uh, kind of uh, platform plans and platform futures and aspirations. Um, I've also used this technique to study uh, the deplatforming of sex after Tumblr banned not safe for work content in 2018. I generally uh, kind of find it a very fruitful technique to use. If you're interested in uh, it, then um, the book that um, you did showed, the selfie book, it has a, a, a chapter that talks about it more. Okay, so finally we've reached the third context and with that the third tactic. So in addition to being multimodal and transient and networked because of technological affordances, social media meaning making is obviously also shaped by cultural norms and values, and at least in twofold ways. So on the one hand, um, and uh, uh, whether we're interacting with others and making meaning in face-to-face -face situations or on social media, it doesn't really matter here, people's behavior and expectations and how they evaluate each other's behavior is shaped by dominant cultural and societal norms. So at their most basic kind of a Parsonian, uh, Parsonian definition, uh, norms are learned rules for acceptable and unacceptable behavior. But then social media spaces can also have their local rules. Um, and I don't mean platforms, community guidelines here, but more the norms that particular cultures and communities that congregate on particular platforms develop. Uh, so we talked earlier about some of the local norms in the not safe work community on Tumblr that I discovered through abduction, um, and also about how their norms were basically a reaction to uh, or a critique of some of the dominant uh, societal and cultural norms. But I want to go one layer deeper here. Uh, because in addition to cultural norms and online group norms, uh, there are these smaller rules, uh, which we can, following Irving Goffman, uh, call situational proprieties. And they are specific to a situation that any one of us can find ourselves in, not just regular members of somewhat stable online groups, communities, or networks. The concept of situational proprieties invites us to think of social media as a series of interactional or communicative situations that we find ourselves in. So Goffman in Behavior in Public Places defines a situation as an environment of communication possibilities. And I think it makes sense to think of social media use as entering a variety of situations. Because while different platforms have interface uh, and governance features, which a large number of people may interpret in a similar way, there are still plenty of people who will use the platform differently from what it was intended uh, for or from the dominant way of using it. Uh, you know, the dominant way of using Instagram is to have a public account where you want to get as much as attention as possible and you do it through these kind of high aestheticized uh, posts. But we know that there are people who have family album type private closed Instagram accounts. Uh, some people have sex work Instagrams, which isn't even allowed technically. Some people have niche meme Instagram accounts that they uh, manage uh, with their 10 friends that are about mental health. So uh, what is appropriate use for them would be different from what is considered the dominant norm uh, of use in, on the platform. Um, uh, plus, there are people uh, who have multiple accounts on the same platform where they interact with different audiences. So these are governed by different situational proprieties. Um, and if we go with uh, Goffman's theory, um, we don't have a problem here because each of these is a different situation. Um, and every situation, according to Goffman, comes with a specific set of rules um, that guide individuals uh, when they are in presence of others. And this is what Goffman calls situational proprieties. So these rules govern usually mostly our involvement with the situation, how involved 
we are and how involved we see. So Goffman wrote about how people who seem not involved in doing anything in public uh, places are breaking the rules because they're seen as loitering or lolling and that's dangerous. Uh, but also people who are over involved in something uh, are suspicious as well. So there is a particular kind of balance of how involved you're supposed to be in a particular situation. He also wrote about people's uh, use of involvement shields, like you read a newspaper on a train so that strangers wouldn't talk to you, um, or you turn off the lights in particular situations, or you accord the status of non-person temporarily to your office mate um, in, uh, to lift the need to follow situational proprieties. So how do we carry this thinking of situational proprieties over to the context of meaning making on social media? Um, on the one hand, um, I think there is a set of rules or situational proprieties about the aesthetics and politics of visibility on social media. So what are the aesthetic criteria for something to be considered okay to show and look at? And what are the representational criteria, i.e. who or what gets to be seen, has the right to be seen? Here we can use the word Instagrammable. Um, as a metaphor for these rules of representation and these hierarchies of value. So um, shared understanding of Instagrammable, just like Bourdieu's shared understanding of photographable in the early Kodak years, indicates what people consider as being worth uh, capturing, storing, communicating, showing, and admiring. Um, so uh, Boudieu claimed that the norms that organize photographic valuation of the world um, are uh, kind of entangled with the implicit systems uh, of values maintained by a class, a profession, or a status group. So we can kind of read them as indications of these collective um, uh, hierarchies and value systems. And on the other hand, there is this set of rules or situational proprieties that emerge out of the everyday practicalities of using social media. So they're basically uh, the things that is okay to do and not okay in terms of the acts that we do, you know, what is like, what are the liking rules? What are the following and following back rules? What are the posting rules? How many times a day is it okay to post or how, like, where does it become lame? Um, so we, these are basically shifts in rules or new rules that have accompanied uh, the spread of the internet and some platforms uh, becoming dominant uh, with their specific affordances um, so that some genres of self-presentation, uh, uh, which have gen generated a lot of attention, have become uh, almost kind of mandatory to follow. Um, so these we can call uh, structures of involvement uh, in the situations uh, of social media, meaning making, borrowing again from Goffman. Um, so, you know, we have uh, rules for unfocused interaction. So these are rules of co-presence, you know, the frequency of posting, hashtagging rules. Uh, we have rules for face engagement. Uh, so, you know, do you have to follow back? Uh, what are the rules for lurking and stalking and commenting? Um, a good example of this is, you know, um, if you go and like, if you make a new friend on social media and then you go back four years in their albums and like all of the pictures four years ago, they will feel supremely creeped out, right? Which means that there is a tacit rule there that we aren't capable of articulating without it being broken. Um, so, this brings us to our, to our last tactic uh, for the day, uh, which is sense making uh, as a way of, wait for it, making sense uh, of meaning on social media. So sense making can, a, can be a bit of a catch all term uh, for understanding and explaining something. And I'm certainly guilty of using it as such. 
Uh, so in that sense, abduction and imitation are already forms of sense making. But in a narrower sense, in the sense that Carl Weick introduced it and that has taken on a life of its own in organizational studies and communication studies, it is a particular process of meaning making. So for Carl Weick, meaning uh, sense making is a kind of uh, process directed at constructing plausible interpretations of ambiguous cues. Um, and the most important aspect of the process of sense making is that it's retrospective. So people do things and then retrospectively make sense of what they have done. So sense making is a process of organizing our experiences and observations of the world by labeling them, by categorizing them, uh, to kind of routinize them so they form plausible explanations and narratives and patterns. But what makes studying sense making useful is that it allows how different meanings are assigned to the same event or the same situation. So for White, uh, sense making is triggered by ambiguity um, and it never ends. So there are these loops of sense making which are triggered by breaks or in routine or kind of shock or surprise. Again, we're back with the surprise. So in our search uh, of understanding the local norms and situational proprieties of uh, a particular social media situation, we are interested in um, uh, these moments of rupture, right? Uh, and how I have used this is uh, by studying conflict. Um, oh, was, oh, there was, sorry. Oh, how exciting. Sorry. Uh, I apparently made the slide do a fancy thing that I didn't mean for it to do. Uh, so conflict um, as sense making. So in that same not safe work Tumblr community that I already told you about, uh, there wasn't a lot of conflict, but when there was some, it stood out. Uh, and I decided to study it. So in particular, uh, I studied uh, four types of image related conflict. So it was about photoshopping images. It was about stealing other people's selfies and posting them as your own. It was about removing captions from under images and reposting those images with different captions. And um, it was about disrespecting uh, the self shooters or the selfie takers uh, ways of curating their blogs. And this again is a lot. So I will only tell you a little bit about one of these uh, conflicts. Uh, so basically what happened was that some people would Photoshop images of professional models that they found on the internet, usually to give them bigger breasts and bigger butts. The internet is full of these pictures, right? But my participants uh, got angry uh, and called the Photoshoppers out um, and uh, called the images grotesque and insulting and often worried um, that the captions of those images uh, when they were reblogged indicated uh, that the audience was unable to understand that the images were altered because they would get uh, reblogged to uh, blogs dedicating to not uh, dedicated to celebrating natural curves, for example. So sometimes uh, my participants would even uh, create these open letter type posts um, where they called the photoshopped images symbolic violence against models, photo photographers, and even the broader not safe work selfie community. So some of the photoshoppers then argued back that this was their creative vision of the female form um, and drew uh, parallels to Picasso or manga. Uh, this wasn't accepted. Um, and the photoshoppers then tried saying that this was a parody or fell under uh, fair use. But the Photoshopper's arguments are actually less interesting in here for my argument about sense making. What is interesting um, is that in this conflict, it suddenly became apparent, and I argue that it wouldn't have come apparent if I just asked people about what their and other people's selfies meant to them, because I did. Um, uh, but so in this conflict, it became apparent what selfies mean and how different those meanings are based on the experiences that people have had. 
So because the photoshoppers themselves did not take or post selfies, they were unable to understand that for people who did, selfies were not just representations of their bodies, they were enactments of their bodies or even embodied performances. Uh, and they were a conscious practice of body positivity. So these uh, exaggeratedly sexualized images, these photoshopped images, represented for the selfie takers a normative gaze, gaze, which was experienced as judgmental. Whereas for photoshoppers, other people's selfies were just visual objects. Uh, like any and all other kinds of visual objects found on the internet, you can collect them, you can accumulate capital by collecting them, uh, you can play with them, you can remix them, they're just stuff, right? You can make memes out of pictures, why can't you, uh, you know, Photoshop other people's images? Um, so, and that, of course, for the people who took selfies, uh, was uh, outrageous to the point of rapey where somebody is manipulating my body. And this quite profound aspect of what selfies mean, um, I was able to understand through uh, kind of studying the sense-making and the boundary-making that happens in conflict. Uh, oh, did I, I think I'm missing a slide. Oh. Uh, Sorry, uh, I, I was already in a slide which I now intended to get to, which is the kind of we're done slide. Uh, so to bring all of this together, uh, my argument is that in order to understand social media content and social media practices, we want to study how meaning is being made. And while there are very many ways to do this, um, and I encourage everyone to experiment, I hope that uh, you have been inspired by my tactics of uh, Letting yourself to be abducted and led away, of imitating what you see your participants doing, and of understanding how your participants make sense of situations that they're in. As I have found that this is how we get at the surprising, the new, uh, or uh, the as of yet unexplained um, aspects um, and meanings. And with this, I am done. <laughs>